truly one of the people in the field who, who need no introduction, and so of course we'll have a little bit of an introduction. Um, within education, um, many will know her um, as a Secretary of Education between 2005 and 2009. Um, that's a big job, as we all know. Um, it's a cabinet level position. It's an agency with a $70 billion budget, 10,000 employees and contractors. Um, and there's been a lot going on in education within the past decade. And since I mentioned decade, um, folks will remember that we just celebrated an anniversary recently. It's the 10th anniversary of No Child Left Behind, uh, which Secretary Spellings was instrumental um, in championing and, and uh, conceptualizing both as a Secretary of Education and previously in her position as a Chief Domestic Policy Advisor, President George W. Bush. Um, although Secretary Spellings has been in Washington for a while now, she is a resident of the Lone, heart, Lone Star State at heart. Um, and we've all seen her on news programs, quoted in the paper, and she's great. Um, that's the easy stuff, though, and what you probably know also, maybe not, um, she's been on Celebrity Jeopardy. She's been on the, Je the John Stewart Show. And she's also been on the Colbert Report. And as somebody who's done my share of media and been on Blue Dobbs tonight uh, five or six times, I would not touch the Colbert Report. <laughs> that's, that's the really hard stuff. Um, so it's with uh, great pleasure that I introduce Secretary Stelz. I mean, I've never been so frank in my life that I'm on Jeopardy. Uh, and so anyway, whatever we're doing here is cannot be as scary as that. I came in second, by the way, uh, uh, and lost to uh, someone who had been on previously. So I felt pretty good about that. So thank you, Chris. It's great to be here. And uh, hello, fellow policy wonks, the diehards. Um, your event today, the Global Challenge, as you said, is the same week as the 10th anniversary of No Child Left Behind. So. Uh, I emailed over the weekend with the president and told him that uh, for my anniversary <coughs> present, uh, he could do an interview with, uh, and he ended up doing an interview with Time Magazine, so I commend that to you with Andy Rotherham. Uh, so I can't let that milestone obviously go unnoticed and, and talk a little bit about what that has meant. Um, when President Bush was campaigning in 1999 and back in our State House days, uh, he talked about what we were trying to do and what we were trying to do in closing the achievement gap. And I think, you know, it's interesting and worthwhile to note that on the long-term NAEP from 99 to 08, African-American and Hispanic 9- and 13-year-olds were performing at least a full grade level ahead of where they were in 1999 in math. The exception was Hispanic 9-year-olds who were two grades ahead of where they were and, of course, uh, in reading, the gains were similar. Now, we can argue about, you know, who gets the credit and so forth, but the point is the accountability and measurement movement, clearer standards and assessments against them, really were uh, an important change. But, of course, we wouldn't be sitting here uh, if we were finished, if we were satisfied in Texas. We say we're pleased but not satisfied, and we have a long, long way to go. Uh, African-American students, as you know, are nearly three times as likely to be identified for special education as their white peers. A third of all of our students don't graduate on time for Hispanic and African-American students. For poor students, that number is approaching half. Students in other countries continue to outperform our kids on international tests. And data indicates that this is true for all of our students, including the uh, so-called high performers, the high flyers. <coughs> I was struck by Rick Hanischak's work that found that only 6% of U.S. students perform at the advanced level in math, a figure that places us behind 30 other countries. And when we looked at that in the context, or they looked at that in the context of individual states, our highest performing states, Massachusetts, for example, ranked 17th. Our lowest performers, Louisiana, West Virginia, New Mexico, and Mississippi, fell between Serbia and Chile. The Bush Institute's global report card found that achievement levels in U.S. school districts uh, that are often viewed as the gold standard of American K-12 education, places like Greenwich, Connecticut, Palo Alto, California, and Reston, Virginia, here in our backyard, uh, are not measuring up internationally. In 07, the math achievement of the average Beverly Hills student was at the 53rd percentile. White Plains, New York at 39th. Gross Point. Michigan at 56th, and Evanston, Illinois at the 48th percentile. So 
sometimes I call this the fat, dumb, and happy syndrome. Uh, these results show that the need to improve our schools is not just an urban problem. And I think it often gets framed out like that, the Nickleby kids versus all kids, which likely comes as a shock to some folks in suburbia. That one of the age-old problems in education, as I need not tell those of you in the media business, is that everybody thinks their school is great, it's all those other schools that stink. Uh, but it's, it's not the case that all of our schools are performing very well. Uh, so we have to do a better job, not just in educating those that are the focal point of No Child Left Behind, but all students. And we know the correlation between achievement and economic growth, of course, is powerful. If we raise students' math scores on PISA by 40 points, we'd see $75 trillion in economic gains by 2090. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, and you all hear and say this yourselves, 3.2 uh, million unfilled jobs while 14 million Americans are out of work. That's pretty shocking. Uh, even worse, as you know, experts predict a shortage of 14 million college-educated workers by 2020, and we're now relitigating the debate about whether post-secondary education is or isn't necessary. Uh, so we're facing a double whammy by standing still or even losing ground while other countries are speeding up and improving their education systems and results. A recent paper by Complete College America highlights the amount of wasted time and, and essentially wasted money on earning a college degree when only 40% of full-time African-American students and 46% of Hispanic students seeking a bachelor's degree do so within six years, and those rates drop to 15% for African-American and 17% for Hispanic for part-time students. So every single data point confirms the problem and we have to do things differently. But be assured that I am not here to be solely the voice of doom and gloom. We do have plenty of reasons to be optimistic about our future if we can build on uh, some public urgency or inspire some public urgency around these things. Uh, it strikes me that, you know, 10 years ago and how far we've come politically, interestingly, that Republicans and Democrats came together to pass No Child Left Behind by amazing bipartisan margins. I have a the signing pen and the vote tally and so forth framed in my office. I think the Bush Library wants to steal it firmly, but they're not going to get it. Um, which it really is striking when you think 87 to 10 in the Senate. This is a, a bill, piece of legislation that affects every community and you know tens of millions of students around our country. And to think that we had that kind of bipartisan uh, consensus is, is uh, surprising on any issue. So I'm really proud of what was accomplished. By testing students from every zip code and background, of course, it gave us quality information that helped us know who needed help uh, and what we needed to do. By requiring all schools to make adequate yearly progress, parents had a better idea about how their schools were doing. By calling for a highly qualified teacher in every classroom, it recognized the single most important factor in student achievement. By offering help like tutoring and the ability to transfer to a higher performing school, it's got student, gotten students back on track and working towards grade level. There's a lot of discussion about whether the law has worked or not, but based on the results that I mentioned earlier, I really think it has, especially for those students in the, that were the focus of this law, poor, minority, and disadvantaged kids. Yet even as we're making progress, we're debating issues such as the very existence of the U.S. Department of Education and the extent to which we should hold states and schools accountable for student achievement. At the heart of these debates, sadly, is what my former boss used to famously call the soft bigotry of low expectations. And here we are talking about letting our schools off the hook because, well, some kids just fall through the cracks, don't they? And I really, you know, in my travels all over the country and all over the world, I've yet to meet a parent, certainly, I didn't feel like this as a parent myself, who didn't want their child to read or cipher at grade level or better when they were in that grade. Have, have you ever met a parent that wanted to you? Is that what you want for your own kids and grandkids? Working for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, I never hear business people say that that's an unreasonable demand of our schools, and that's simply what the law asks for. But of course, that's not deterred the critics. Some say the law was intended not to improve public schools, but to label them as failures because schools must make annual progress towards improving student achievement. Stu schools, as you know, were given a 12-year window until 2014 to bring students to grade level proficiency, a fairly modest level, 
as Secretary Duncan has observed repeatedly and as a way to make the case for the Common Core. Uh, let's face it, some of our schools should close their doors. When 15% of the nation's schools produce more than half the dropouts, something's got to change. We cannot continue to delude ourselves that half of the minority kids can't get out of high school on time, but all the schools are fantastic. It just doesn't add up. So, you know, it, this, uh, this stigmatization argument is, in my view, a red herring. Because what about the stigma of a high school graduate who can't land a job because they didn't have the right skills or couldn't read or a college freshman that has to take a lot of remedial work? In 2010, the private sector spent $50 billion on job training and remedial education. Just think how many workers could have been hired with those funds. Last fall, feeling some of this, this heat that is a perennial for, for all policymakers in education, President Obama announced that states could apply for waivers to the law's accountability requirements. Given that states have previously sought waivers to mask the underachievement in their schools and push off confronting needed changes, I'm skeptical that many states will use this approach to advance reform, but time will tell. When I was the Secretary of Education, I was bombarded with calls for waivers from the law, and I feel for Secretary Duncan these days. Utah perennially submitted a, a waiver to educate only 75% of its students to grade level. Kentucky wanted to hold school, schools accountable every other year instead of every year. Of course, I didn't approve these requests, but I do understand and did use the waiver authority to try things like the growth model and other uh, policy uh, changes that, that we uh, believed we were right for. And I, I know that uh, Secretary Duncan is considering these, these issues now, and I, I hope it'll hang tough. It's our job as the public, as taxpayers, and as the business community, and as parents, to keep an eye on these waivers, to watch the fine print, to ensure that they're not a retreat from real accountability for all students. Some states have taken advantage of the administration's Race to the Top initiative. They wrote wonderful accountability plans, made impressive promises, took the money, and now this week we learned that only three states are on schedule with their plans, six face moderate delays, and the remaining three are significantly behind schedule. I wonder how the losing states feel about that, those that did not get funds. If some states are playing fast and loose with the law, the answer is not to return to the old days, the pre-accountability days, when the federal government funded failure, when it was assumed that poor and minority kids couldn't learn, it's time for us to look ourselves in the mirror and hold ourselves accountable. It seems these days that bipartisanship in education now means that Democrats and Republicans in Washington are trying to exempt adults from doing the tough work of improving schools. Unfortunately, bills introduced in both houses of Congress by both parties would let states and school districts off the hook. They'd not have to set goals for improving student achievement across the board or closing the gap <coughs> at all. The Senate bill would require that only 5% of the lowest performing schools be accountable for making progress, while the House bill wouldn't require any schools to be held accountable for making annual progress. And both bills would shrink the options for parents of kids stuck in, in failing schools. This might be good and comfortable for adults, but it's really not so good for the students. Some voices in my own party, as I said, believe the answer is to close the doors of the Department of Education, rather than close the doors of the dropout factories around the country. Under the banner of local control, they'd rather see standards and accountability slip than give the federal government any oversight of the billions of dollars that we spend. Even though the states themselves, as you know, not the feds, set the standards and develop the assessments. It's frustrating that instead of tackling the very real issues of accountability and the achievement gap, most of the discussion, certainly in Washington, is how to slow down rather than speed up or take issue with the premise that all can achieve at basic levels in reading and math. While the rest of the world is speeding ahead on innovation and human capital, we are in a time warp. U.S. schools today look much like they did 50 years ago. While you and I use cell phones, iPads, and Kindles to access information for, tailored to our own needs, students go, go to schools using paper textbooks and paper and pencil tests. Parents and teachers wait for months to get test results and information on how schools or students are doing too late for them to make good decisions. 
principles that have revolutionized nearly all areas of our lives, like customi customization, competition, technology, modern management, and relentless focus on the consumer must be brought to bear in our schools. We must take advantage of America's edge in innovation and competition that have made our country great. If customization and technology were really embraced, <coughs> the school day and year would be tailored to individual students, and teachers would better adapt to their needs. We pay the best teachers what they deserve and measure them by student results, not just seniority. We put our most skilled teachers in the most challenging settings instead of just the opposite, as we often do now. High-performing countries pay significant attention to attracting, selecting, and preparing their teachers, and it's time for us to do the same. Finland was not always widely regarded as having a world-class education system. What brought the country from performing below that of other European countries in the 60s to leading this group in 2000 is in part a focus on selecting and preparing excellent teachers. It is difficult to become a teacher in Finland. Only one in ten applicants is accepted into teacher education programs, and obviously it's made a difference. The U.S. has started to take some of these lessons from abroad and incorporate them into policy and practice. Common Core is one example. While we're not dramatically moving away towards moving towards centralization of our system, nor am I advocating that, there has been a definite shift towards having a comparable system to measure academic quality. And today's report highlights the 29 states that use international comparisons to help guide their reform efforts, and I'm proud that they do. Leaders in these states understand the need to prepare their students to compete, not just with their neighboring states, but globally. If we truly want to move forward, we'd be open to a much broader scale to learning what works around the world. We'd see the value in choice, in alternative certification, adjunct faculty, virtual instruction, and a host of other approaches like we have in our higher education system. In other words, we'd serve the students, not just the adults. Now, I know times change, and so do laws, but whatever No Child Left Behind becomes, whatever its new name, we can't break the promises we made 10 years ago. No Child Left Behind wasn't just a name. It actually described the policy. We must continue to focus on all children, not just a few, and on all states, not exempting those by giving them permission slips or hall passes. We need to continue testing all students annually in reading and math and holding ourselves accountable, especially when it's uncomfortable. We need to do what works and stop doing and funding what isn't. We need to give reformers room to reform, and above all, we must believe that our children can do it, each and every one of them. High standards and great results begins with high expectations. You all may never have heard of the Committee of Ten, but it set the standard for public education at the dawn of the 20th century here in the U.S. The committee said that students, quote, should all be treated alike, with every subject taught in the same way and to the same extent, no matter what the probable destination of the pupil. We got away from that ideal in the 20th century a bit. As U.S. Secretary of Education, I often visited parents of all backgrounds, races, and ethnicities, and I asked them what they wanted for their kids. The hopes and dreams they held for their children were the same as we have for ours. The skills to get a job and live the American dream. It's time we get serious about this promise to our children. We're up to the task, and they're counting on us. Thank you.
increasing, you know, stepping up the pace. So I guess how would you specifically address that in terms of, you know, what more should we be doing, can we do realistically to move this ball down the court? Well, I think we have to con start by continuing to have that expectation and be transparent about it and require folks to get there within a particular <coughs> A uh, defined period of time, clearly 2014 needs to be recalibrated, and then assist, insist on some consequences when that doesn't occur. And what troubles me so much about what I'm seeing in the Congress is basically a kind of a we give up attitude. There's no requirement for target, there's no deadline, there's no who are you talking about. It's just put the money out and hope for the best. And we've tried that for 40 years, and we had a you know, flat achievement and a growing gap. And so, I, I, you know, I think it all starts with, you know, this clarion call about what our expectation is. That was the beauty of No Child Left Behind. It is, as I, you know, continue to say, you know, staggering to me that, that, that if, you know, if you're, I don't know if you're mom or not, but if you, if you went to a school and they told you they thought they could get your kid on a grade level within 12 years, you'd have them out of there before noon. And this idea that what we want for our kids is somehow different than what African American, Hispanic, and poor people want for theirs. Or that we have to do all these other things before the conditions are right and we can get to work on that. It just, it makes me mad. <laughs> so I think it starts with expectations and being very clear and precise and tough and taking money away from states that aren't doing it. And you know, this idea that there's this unbridled innovation uh, out there that's been thwarted uh, by the law is rid ridiculous. We passed the word it's not against the law to close the achievement gap. Any governor can do it starting today. <laughs> Doesn't mean that you have to do business differently, you bet, but um, I, I, again, this retreat from it's even possible is what's so troubling. Um, I could go on about what some things you know, that are happening in Finland in terms of also um, not issuing punitive measures, for example, against specific schools or districts. And I wonder how you feel about that. Posse Solberg talked this morning about um, the issue of trust and the fact that schools have greater control over what they're doing. There's sort of a national framework, but they're invested with more faith and trust from the government in following and pursuing those ideas. Do you think that could ever work here? Or do you think it's a mission impossible? Well, I, I think we have to be, you know, have more sophisticated, you know, PhD level accountability measures, more transparent, more facile, more timely, you know, that, that I think will aid and abet some of that. And I think that will get away from some of this sort of high stakes kind of mentality, which is really more about the grown ups than it is about the kids. And um, so uh, obviously we're not at any time soon going to have, nor should we, a you know, highly centralized system. But, you know, Finland, uh, you know, we wouldn't even have quality counts if we didn't have measurement, right? And they wouldn't know if they were making progress if it, if it, weren't, uh, if it weren't for that. So should it be more, uh, more transparent, easier to use, and more timely? You bet, but that doesn't mean we better, you know, get rid of accountability because we tried it and it didn't close the achievement gap. Um, and of course, getting to accountability, I mean, teachers are obviously, many good teachers, many excellent teachers are very frustrated by the testing system. They feel it's impeding on their instructional time. They feel it's curtailing what they can actually do in the classroom. Um, Mary Bell, who recently wrote a, an opinion piece for us on our NCLB 10th anniversary issue, talked about the fact that she's been a teacher for 30 years. She's the head of the Wisconsin Education Association. And she said, you know, she finds that NCLB has done a lot of great things, but she feels that the assessment process itself is really too simplistic. Mm -hmm. Do we blow up the system? Are these consortia the end, you know, game? What's the, what well, should we well, do? Well, time will tell on the consortia. I mean, you know, as I said, we, we've just barely begun to do assessment. This is the kind of the crudest form of assessment you could have. It's better, absolutely better than nothing, which is what we had for a very long time. <coughs> In fact, it strikes me that just 10 years ago when this law passed, you know, we had literally, you know, single-digit number of states that actually had what I've called meaningful accountability systems, every year assessment and disaggregation of data. So it was sort of the snapshot guessing day. So when you think about it, states have really come a pretty long way in 10 years to set standards to have assessments and to report <coughs> data. Um, we find and, and reviewed uh, a lot of states where there was a, a misalignment between the curriculum and the measurement. And I'm share a teacher's frustration when the, when the curriculum that they're teaching is not what's actually measured and then they're held accountable for that. So can we do it a whole lot better? Yes. The, but the policy notion that, you know, we have to be clear and transparent and uh, sophisticated about measurement is absolutely the way to go. 
Um, and the last question I'll ask before we open it up is about teacher education, which came up today frequently, and the fact that you know we really have no national requirements for what it means to be a teacher. What do we do? I mean, do we just live with what we have? What do you have suggestions? If you could wave a magic wand, as John Stewart asked you a couple of years ago, you know, what would you do to improve that system? Well, I think, and this maybe is, I think when you, when I hear questions framed like that, there's there's sort of a, a an idea that what will work better is much more uh, credentialing, more process, more standardization, more centrality around those those things, and and I'm not sure that's the right solution. We certainly have tried a lot of that kind of thing, um, and I think teachers and students have often been ill served by it. What I think we ought to do is what we have done a lot of in, in American higher education, which is to say that we have experts who teach classes, we have adjunct faculty. This idea that there's only one way to come into the classroom, and it's to be available 180, 190 days a year from X to Y with this sort of you know single file kind of idea is just you know ill-conceived, especially as we have shortages in STEM. STEAM and every other kind of field, especially in our needy, uh, neediest campuses. So why can't we have you know NASA scientists teaching you know two sections of of chemistry in the spring only? Uh, you know we're just not set up to do that sort of thing. So I think getting an, an influx of talent in ways that are uh, more open and more accommodating, as we've done in every other kind of area of American life. Um, and measuring against that, I mean, let's align those those sorts of things with student achievement. Let's see who's doing the job. Is is maybe a, a new way to think about this, as opposed to kind of the command and control thing that we tried and retried. Okay, I'm gonna open it up. Can we have a microphone, and please give us your name and your affiliation. Mark Hyatt, uh, just. Uh, Retired as a superintendent in Colorado after 10 years, and thank you for your leadership in our nation. God bless um, you. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I'm very concerned about, uh, I just came to D.C., I've been here a week now, and I'm leading a group called the Character, Educa Character Education Partnership that's concerned about the kind of children and their character that graduate, just as concerned about that as they are math and, and English. But uh, there seems to be an emerging national scandal I'm reading about where teachers are putting on plastic gloves and going in on weekends and changing test uh, answers on standardized tests Atlanta. But it's not just Atlanta. I don't want to pick on them. It's, it's right. emerging from around the country, hundreds and even thousands. Houston. Houston. Well, and I worry that as we, and I'm a big pro, uh, proponent of merit and, and uh, merit pay and performance pay, but is this a uh, an un unintended consequence of moving to that, and now teachers feel they have to cheat. Good question, and hi, Linda. <laughs> um, you know, character education, that, that's, a gr that's a great life after superintending uh, uh, enterprise, and, and I know, uh, I'm glad you're working on it. I, again, I think it, it speaks to sort of the crudeness of our assessment instruments, that they are you know, able to be manipulated in that way, their pencil and paper and their scanned and so on. And I think if technology, if, you know, if, if and when we get to the day where those sorts of assessments are embedded in technology or, uh, you know, more incorporated into <coughs> observational type uh, measurement and so forth, I mean, I think we can do a better job that will mitigate against some of those, some of those things. But I think the truth of the matter is, those are, you know, rarities. Obviously, most, the vast, vast majority of our teachers are highly ethical, wonderful people that we'd be proud to have our kids with uh, any day. And I think we ought to, you know, call it out because I think it's shameful for the rest of the profession um, and, and attempt to it, but, uh, you know, and use it as an example with kids. Thank you for the question. Do you, let me just follow up on that. Do you think it's a, a a cultural issue in the sense that the pressure from testing, I mean, this is what a lot of people are talking about, right? Pressure from testing is causing, you know, superintendents, principals, teachers to incur, maybe not superintendents, but, um, you know, situation in Atlanta, D.C., California, um, to cheat. I mean, do you think that's the case, or do you think it's really an individual situation where you can't really make a generalization about what, you know, the, the sort of culture is of the... The testing. Yeah. I, I think more of the latter, and I also want to say that, so what's the alternative? No testing? No measurement? Let's go back to the, let's, we don't even care enough to find out? 
I mean, I think, I mean, that's what, the, that's the alternative, right? And so I wonder often if it's a little bit of a, you know, red herring, sky is falling kind of thing because the real motivation is let's get rid of that test. Really like. But could, could, could sort of greater buy-in, for example, the teacher ambassador program that you started at the department that continues to the stage one way that teachers are becoming, in theory, more involved in policy, yeah. right? I mean, it's a few number of teachers. We have, I don't know, 55,000 of them in the country. I mean, Industry. Experiences like that yeah. might help teachers. I mean, I think one of the things they feel is really uh, totally disempowered. Yeah. So are those ways to kind of, or what are some other ways that teachers can feel more in control of what's happening and maybe have greater buy-in and maybe feel like, okay, this isn't the end of the world? You know, how would you? I, I, absolutely, and I think governors can create programs like that or even superintendents in large school districts where teachers have a little bit more of a window into, I think, you know, one, it, it, it's sort of, it's a one-way street, and I feel, think they feel, you know, often dumped on that they, nobody considered, well, did they think about what this means in, in my life? And so I, I do think programs like that, even though they're small, uh, can, can be important. You know, I'm all ears. If teachers have ideas about how to do that and how to do it better, it's with the operating principle that, you know, assessment and measurement that's transparent, valid, reliable, and useful is here to stay. Paul, do we have anything from... Yeah, we have a couple. Okay, uh, one of the questions is, within teacher preparation, do you think a program such as you teach is a promising way to address the lack of highly effective teachers in STEM fields? And would you support funding it further? Well, I sure do. And for those of you who don't know about UTeach, that uh, the UT is the University of Texas. Now, this also is an opportunity, thank you for giving me the opportunity to brag on the University of Texas, uh, was a program that was created there that now has expanded uh, often through NIMSI, through the National uh, Math and Science Initiative that is Exxon, uh, significantly funded by Exxon, uh, has gone uh, in very powerful ways around the country. And then the essence of it is that teachers are subject matter experts and teachers. So they're math majors who become teachers, not teachers who become proficient at, at some level in math. And it's it's quick. I mean, it's, it doesn't take, you know, 10 years to do it. It's a you know, four plus, uh, four or five year program. And so it's, it makes a lot of sense and it's very affordable and, and it has the value of attracting a uh, higher level of uh, entrant into the, into the profession. So I'm a big fan of it. Uh, we did do some, some funding of it when I was in office. I know obviously resources are scarce. One of the things that I think is the next big thing in education is to start to use our, our assessment information, and I'm looking at you, Amy, to start thinking about how we how we spend money. We don't know how much it costs to, how much is the third grade versus the fourth grade? How much is algebra versus art? How much is, you know, to use information in a way that, as a you teach teacher, more cost efficient, if you will, than one who's been prepared or, you know, traditionally or through, uh, or Teach for America. I mean, we ought to know this sort of thing. No other enterprise of this scale would operate with as little information about using resources and the outcomes of it as we do in education. And I think that's where we need to go, especially in times of constrained resources. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Okay, Paul, go for it. Okay, alternative certification programs are becoming more prevalent these days. And many of these programs place teachers in the classroom for two years, then move on. How do we change this expectation among these programs? while still providing alternate routes for certifications for career changers. Yeah, so I guess the, the two-year reference is, is a reference to Teach for America, and what I know about that is that many of those folks do not leave the education profession. Some do leave the classroom, but they end up in principalships or working for Teach for America or are somehow involved in education. Um, so yes, I mean, again, to my point about how we need to open up the pathways to getting folks that are talented and able uh, in our schools, absolutely. Alternative certification, adjunct faculty, uh, career changers, baby boomers. Basically, I'm trying to find a job when I get through with all of this. Thing. <laughs> or, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Be, before we say thank you, I'd like to just take the host prerogative and <coughs> ask a question of my own. Um, it's been a couple of years since you were at the Department of Education now, and I'm sure some days it feels like you're still there. Um, I think people have strong feelings about no child left behind and kind of, you know, the good, the bad, and, you know, the in-between. I'm curious, stepping back a little bit, so we're 
into 2012 now. Um, it's an election year. It's the 10th anniversary of No Child Left Behind. And for a fair amount of the past year, there was some serious-ish discussion about reauthorizing No Child Left Behind. We hosted a series of events, actually, with AAR ourselves on, on those very issues. And one of the big themes um, that's come up, in part because of the political dynamic in the country, one side of the aisle, in some cases, arguing to get rid of the Department of Education. The other side, quite frankly, seems to be kind of abdicating itself from you know strong positions of some kind, one kind or another, um, or at least you know kind of sees some sort of handwriting on the wall. Um, and I think defenses of some certain kind of existing positions are not as rigorous as they have been. And we just don't see that kind of bipartisanship that we did ten years ago. Um, which I think is an important part of the context of the law that, that we often forget about nowadays. So, given that you've you know, been out of the, the secretary's position for a while, this question about that's come up a lot about the size of the federal footprint within education, um, given the challenges we have, given you know, kind of where we've been in the last 10 years and where we'd like to go, what's your take on that? I think it is the ultimate red herring and you know the idea that the federal role is so intrusive that it has prohibited a closing of the achievement gap is ridiculous. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And likewise, state law. And I do think No Child Left Behind and federal policy generally gets blamed for a lot of kind of the trickle down that actually the dumb stuff that the teachers are on the front end of. But it's just the latest, uh, you know, uh, mask or excuse for kind of underachievement, and you know. So, and I think both, both sides have their own motivation. I mean, obviously the Democrats are concerned about uh, teacher unions and other folks who are on the, the payroll, and frankly, uh, Republicans are concerned about spending money on anything, and often don't represent, you know, Nickleby kids. So it ain't their problem. And I think those two forces come together to, to the detriment of kids. See, what I, this is the kind of stuff I get to say because I don't have to be accountable. <laughs> <laughs> well, we wanted to make sure you had a chance to tell us what you really think. Um, so this has been great. This is, this is a great way to end the formal program. So thank you, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.